Right, we'll keep looking around here. I think it's quite encouraging. Aubrey's gone down the same road, and I think Scott is in this block where that steering book was. It is a very large block, so that those lines could be anywhere inside the block. We're going to drive around here. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I swallowed the frog. We're going to go along the road here and turn down towards what is known as the Gari Repeater. And that's where a lot of the... There's a little road that goes in there. We'll hang on here while... Go ahead, Aubrey. <laughs> Coffee, thank you. <laughs> Aubrey spotted the lions on the road we just drove along. <laughs> That means I drove straight past them, everyone. That's not very good at all. It is difficult, in my defense, to, um, to look you in the eye and spot animals. <laughs> very poor. Sorry about that. What we'll do is we'll go in and we'll establish the sighting. And then because Scott's been looking for them, he can come over here and have a look and see. And then we'll go to the hyena then. second Nancy in Texas I will talk to you now I'm just listening to Aubrey um, Nancy oh there lion running across the road yeah okay, just in there These are not the same ones that Aubrey's got here. There, look, there's the lioness. Oh, we've got one lioness here further north of your position now running down south through the block. Hold on, everybody. Sorry about the noise. Confirm court. Okay. Apparently they're chasing some wildebeest. Uh, it's going to get very thick in here. She's still running through there. I can see her. Don't worry about the trees that we are running over at the moment. They're an encroacher species called Strychnos madagascarensis. There, there's some, uh, you can hear maybe some zebra alarm calling. You probably can't hear anything. They've caught the zebra, it sounds like. Hold on. Hold on, everybody. David, are you still there? Yeah. Sounds like they've caught a zebra in here. Oh, we're not going to get through that way. That's a dead tree. Oh, it's just going into the position. I was following that line. It's through the bush. Watch your heads, everyone. A big hole here dug by. In fact, there's a whole warren of holes there dug by an ark park. I promise you the noise that you're hearing is a lot worse than it is in real life. Well, we are in real life. Scott is still off the vehicle tracking. Right, they came running across here. I heard the zebra going, whoop, 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 whoop. That's what they do when they're alarmed. You can see there, something's been running across the, the road. 
Aubrey's in front of us there, so we're going to try and catch up with him there. They're definitely trying to kill. Aubrey, have you got visual there? Oh, they've killed. There's something alarming. Oh, come on, you silly car. I can't get the car in the Yeah, I got them. Uh, Just in here. What's over here, Dave? Is there a zebra alarm calling? Copy horse. Um, we're moving, you know, that's my best approach. Shot there. Yeah, Dave. we're right there. Not the very man. Yeah. Yeah, they've killed it. Yeah, they've killed his every day. Just right now. Sneak in here. Is that right, Dave? It's still alive. So, just for all of you who perhaps this is going to be difficult to watch, I know it's hard, I know it's not nice. These lions have to eat. Although there is a very distressing sound coming out of the zebra, it won't be feeling anything. It will be in complete shock. I'm just going to be silent. dead everyone I think it's dead now no it's not I know this is very very difficult to watch I'm just going to be quiet let's see what happens here and then we'll talk about it afterwards That is the alarm of the rest of the zebra herd. They're obviously still quite traumatized. The cat, you want to know why they don't kill it. Cat, one of them does have its mouth the windpipe. They don't think like that cat. They think 
in terms of here is food, let us eat it now. I don't think let's kill it first, it's not making a noise anymore. As it was making a noise, she clamped her mouth over its windpipe. That's a lioness at the far end there. I think it's dead now. This is the most raw that you will ever see the wilderness. them fighting with each other that growling is not growling at the living thing it is them growling at each other now this is a zebra foal it's a youngster I don't believe it's more than maybe two or three months old the zebras are coming closer they're just trying to investigate where the lions are they're not going to try and defend this hapless foal now Donna, you want to know which parts of this zebra they'll eat first? A little zebra like this with all five lions, they'll have at it at every angle they can. And you'll see that three of them, though, have gone for the soft underbelly. So that's normally the first thing that an animal will try and get hold that the cats will try and get hold of. I think that that leg kicking there, everyone, is is just nerve response now. You can see this is the lioness that was at the head. She's the one who took the responsibility to clamp the windpipe shut. The zebra is now dead. And Mark, as you say, what a brilliant observation. You say that the choker is normally the last one to eat. That's exactly what's happened here. The choker has come round to the back to try and get at the good meat at the hind end and she is the last to eat. Now, this is going to get pretty gory, I must just warn you everyone, but there is no pain being felt by that zebra anymore. It is dead and this is the rawest you'll ever see the wilderness and I don't know I'd love to know how it made you feel so send through in three words if you wouldn't mind hashtag safari live questions at wildearth.tv tell us in three words how seeing the life suffocated out of that zebra made you feel I have my own feelings and um, I'm sure you will have yours But it is a profound experience to me to have, to see the life of something snuffed out like that. Hello Mike in Florida and Jaguar. You want to know if the other guides saw the takedown? No, they didn't see the takedown, they just heard the alarm call. Aubrey spotted them, the first ones, then we spotted the second one, we followed her through the block there, and he saw them chase the zebra, he didn't see it, them actually kill. What an experience. And of course, other than the zebra, we should feel sorry for Scott, who's actually tracking them. Right. How did that make you feel, Dave? Oh, sorry. Now, Rock and Rolly, you had a sighting of five lions yesterday, the Inkohuma Pride. Yes, this is the Inkohuma Pride. Unless I'm very much mistaken. But this is the Inkohuma Pride five lionesses and they're now in a feeding frenzy. The zebra will not last for the next hour. The 
it's amazing how when that life is gone how the the sense of stress dissipates and we're into a sense of wonder at the strength and power of these lions and that blood curdling growl that they give to each other is just quite something Now look at this, Boyd, this is asked, answering your question, Boyd, you want to know, you're in North Carolina and you want to know if lions will eat at leisure or do they eat as fast as they can in order to kind of finish the kill before something can come and steal it. Boyd, they will kill and then eat as fast as possible, but if it is a big animal like a buffalo or a giraffe, they will not be able to eat it all at once, and so they yeah, other zebras alarm calling behind us. And so they will eat it until they are stuffed full, then they will lie on either side of the kill and then come back and feed periodically. Buffalo can last three days, giraffe four or five days. The zebra is not going to last, I don't think, the next hour or two. You can see they're absolutely voraciously eating it. They are all of the internal organs are already finished. The stomach has been finished. You saw that come out. There's a real smell of innards around here at the moment. Whew. Now, Brian in Toronto, you want to know if it's true or not that the trauma that is apparent when we look at something like this is not as bad for the animal being killed as it does actually look. Brian, I think that is the case. We are, as mammals, are programmed to go into shock. Adrenaline course through our bodies, our kind of instinctual brain takes over, we stop feeling, we get tremendous strength boost. Same happens with human beings in conflict situations if they're in a, in a battle. And I think it's exactly the same. The only kind of kicker to that would be to say that once the animal is down, and it's not, um, it's not dead yet. Obviously the adrenal gland cannot keep producing adrenaline. And if it doesn't die quickly, then I'm sure that there is an element of pain. But of course it doesn't remember that pain at all. That's probably only a minute or two. And if the pain becomes too great, of course the animal will just pass out. What a wonderful three words from Lucy in South Bend in Indiana. You say sad, death, life. Yes, brilliant. I think that's an excellent way of putting it, Lucy. I definitely feel a sense of sadness. And there we go, Robin, circle of life, absolutely. And I've, I'm sure, I'm no doubt, all of you now are not feeling anything like the way you were when we stopped here. Traumatic to watch the actual death, but now it's five predators feeding on their well-earned, hard-earned kill. Now Vicky, good question. It's a small zebra, probably weighing in at roughly, mm, let's say 60 kilograms or so. And Vicky, that's not big. How many pounds is that? That's probably about 140 pounds. You want to know if they will kill again after this? Will they hunt again or will they go and rest? Vicky, they will most certainly have a rest. If, however, something was to come past here, 
they would almost unquestionably take it down if it didn't look like it was going to be too much effort. Now there is a hyena apparently making its way here. We won't turn the camera to it just yet. It was spotted by Brent Leo Smith who is in fact guiding some guests today from Juma. struggle to try and kind of take out these lions is certainly not going to manage to frighten off five lionesses. I'll keep an eye out as soon as we as soon as we get a view we will show you. <laughs> and Brian you say brutal, sad and necessary. Brilliant. And Manzi, you say tears, tears, tears. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely an element of that. I felt, I felt, I always feel quite traumatized when I see these things. We'll just keep looking behind us for the hyena. Take my jacket off after that hair raising dry through the bush. And the air now, of course, filled with a totally different scent, so where we were smelling the petrichor, the lovely smell of wetted earth before, we are now into the space where we're smelling guts, basically. Undigested plant material, which is not the most pleasant smell in the world. But isn't this amazing? What an absolutely astonishing privilege to be able to have witnessed this thing today. It's your first kill, though. First. David's first kill. So I think it, it. I mean, this kill will definitely go quite far for them. It will. Um, it will satisfy them for a day or two. Whether they will choose to kill or not, again, will very much depend on the opportunities that present itself and, of course, the weather. We don't often see lions, of course, killing during the day. It hardly ever happens like that. And when we do see it, it's just a real pleasure. Because normally it's done under cover of darkness, except on a day like this where the wind is blowing. They're difficult to smell. And so the predator prey are always a little bit weary. It's why we not we haven't seen a lot of animals today. We've been driving around, the wind has been rustling through the leaves, the rain is damping any smells, and so the lions will hunt. They know that the herbivores are at a disadvantage. You can hear the crunching now of flesh and bone. Now, Erin in Michigan, I, you ask a fascinating question that the textbooks will t explain exactly the way you have. That the lions will go for the organs first because they are the most nutritious. I think the softness of the underbelly certainly lends itself to the first axis. The organs are full of nutrition. They're also full of fat. Now remember that a fat, fat is a nutrient in very short supply out here and it's necessary, it's, it's a good nutrient for something like a lion to produce energy from and so Yes, the organs are an excellent one to go for first. Now, the only th reason I am saying this with a little bit of sort of hesitation is that a cheetah, which has the most trouble getting into an uh, into a carcass, it's got smaller teeth, it has to eat the fastest, will go in through the backside. They will always eat out the back end first. They will try and eat the rich meat in the hind quarters first. Hearing some rustling in the leaves. Thinking maybe the hyena is approaching. 
but it isn't. So yeah, I think it is. I think it's a bit of both. I think it's because of the um, because of the nutrition and the access to get in. Now, Sean, you're in Secunda, <coughs> and you want to know if this these conditions are perfect hunting conditions. I think I'd say they're slightly sub perfect. This sort of atmosphere, wind, rain at night would be even better for them but they will take the opportunity during the day like this they obviously sensed that there was some zebra downwind of them they knew they wouldn't be picked up on the wind and they knew that with the wind blowing through the trees like this they had a very good chance now I just want to give you a sense of the scale of these animals these are not small animals these are bigger than any dog you've ever seen in your life before they are bigger than obviously than any cat you've ever seen before and we're looking at these adult females sitting at about 120 kilograms that's about 260 pounds that is an enormous animal it is built for strength for hunting for speed and for fighting which means that it is an immensely immensely powerful animal five of them the zebra foal would have stood no chance whatsoever. Now that crunching sound that you can hear is not the so much those great big sharp canines which would have been used to do the initial damage. It's the carnassial teeth, it's the molars which are like sharp edged blades slicing the meat off the bone and off the skin. <clears throat> and that's what that crunching sound you can hear is. And I don't know if you notice this or not, but there's complete silence from the other two vehicles next to us. Everybody is overcome by the incredible nature of what we've seen here. hyena perhaps approaching. The hyenas of course renowned for their ability to eat bones and Jen you're in Minnesota you all know if the lions will eat some of the bones. Um, they will eat some of them yes. I think the large femur and perhaps the front shoulder bones they won't eat. They won't eat the hips I don't think but they will eat the smaller bones definitely. The only reason they don't eat all the bones is they don't really have the teeth for it or the jaw muscles like a hyena does. The hyenas will get something from this. Now, a hyena who has come across this, they're incredibly patient, will normally just lie off in the distance, keep a safe distance from them, and then as soon as they disappear off to go and have a drink, or perhaps they decide they've had enough of this kill, he'll sneak in and eat the rest of the bone. And what he'll be going for also, very fat-rich, nutrient-rich section, the middle of the bone, the bone marrow, and that is what the lions will struggle to get at. Gracie, aged just eight in Ohio, you say you had to turn it off for a little while at the beginning, but now it's fine. One zebra feeds five lions, it's necessary, and the zebra is now playing in heaven. Well, I hope it is, Zebria, um, Gracie. I think that's a really nice thought. I also think that there are many people, not just you, Gracie, and lots of adults, who will feel exactly the same, where even if they did watch that the zebra dying, the feeling that they have now will be very different from the feeling they had as the life was unfortunately being removed from the zebra. It's very difficult to watch, but now, as you say, it's fine. It just looks like some lions having a meal. British Columbia, your three words for the scene, nature's awful symmetry. Yep, very nice, very nice way to look at it. 
a quote that I often try and remember the exact words to, which I never can, to my eternal discredit. But I heard David White say it once, and I think it comes from a Native American um, sort of uh, chieftain's speech. And he says, or he's talking to a youngster about being lost in the forest. And he talks about the fact that the wilderness will kill you just as soon as it will save you. So the wilderness looks on us and looks on all of the animals here with a kind of, um, what should we say, what's the word I'm searching for, with an indifference. We are all part of the wilderness, these lions, the zebra and us. And so while we draw tremendous strength from the wilderness, it is well to remember, of course, and that is why we love it so much, that it will save us just as soon as it will kill us. Hmm. I do feel sorry for poor old Scott, of course. I wonder if he's back on the vehicle. He must be thrashing his head against the steering wheel at this stage. Boyd, you're in North Carolina, you say one zebra feeds five lions. Nature's, I think, what did you call it? You called it nature's perfect form. Absolutely. And Sorry, nature at its purest, yes. Wilderness at its most pure and most raw. Now, Boyd, you also want to know if lions have a favorite food. No, but they do specialize. Some prides will specialize. This pride normally eats them. Um, I've seen them eat a baby zebra, in fact, in this exact area before. But they will also eat buffalo. And this pride is particularly good at killing buffalo. And possibly less so since they lost their old chum, Junior, who was a young male who lived with them and is now absconded in order to avoid the attentions of the Birmingham boys. But Yes, prides don't necessarily have a favourite food taste-wise, but they will certainly often specialise. Mm. Quite amazing. I'm just going to try and get hold of Scott. I'm not sure where he is. So I think it might be well to hand over the sighting to him, given that he was tracking them. Scott, do you copy Scott? Hey, Mr. James. <laughs> Scott, I'm sure you've had the update. Um, if you would like to take over here, please pull in at any time. Thanks very much, James, uh, but I'm, I'm happy. Let's carry on. Scott says he's happy. I think he's being kind. Oh well, luck of the draw. Now, Susan in New York in Long Island, New York, as we watch the lions devouring bits and pieces of this zebra. You want to know if there is anything that they will not eat of the zebra? Yes, there is. They will avoid eating the uh, hooves. They are totally indigestible. And even hyenas can't digest hooves. They'll eat them, but often they'll come out almost intact out the other end, which must be a deeply painful experience. And the hair is also indigestible, so while they will no doubt eat some of it, uh, they will probably leave quite a lot of the skin behind. So the skin and the hooves they will probably leave. But the rest will be swallowed gratefully. I'm just going to tell you what, I'm going to sneak a little bit forward and see if we can't get a slightly different angle. 
just for the sake of it, just so that you can see a little bit more of the feeding. Let's go across to Scott while I move the car. He's got something interesting to show you. Hello everyone, and we're just playing around here with this little device, selfie stick, pow, and there's a little feed coming through to my phone. There's a slight delay as you would have noticed. Um, oops, not, not a very good cameraman, that's why VM rushed out of there. Awesome stuff with the lion, and well done to you and James for racing into that action as quickly as you did. I know some of the images initially might have been quite difficult, but it is nature, and you must consider yourselves lucky to be a part of that action. It doesn't happen often. So I'm going to take you to show you a nest of a red-breasted swallow. They're a monogamous couple that live in this area, and we saw them perching on this buffalo thorn tree earlier, and I finally pieced together the puzzle that they will be nesting in this road culvert. They often nest in road culverts, which is basically a pipe underneath the road, and I'm going to take you along to go and see it now. Cool. So, What's interesting is that they prefer to nest in these road culverts as opposed to any other place. So if there wasn't these man-made structures where they would nest as under logs or in termite mounds, that would be a good place. But they've got this incredible ability to build these wonderful kind of upside-down igloos, you could say. And you guys are going to have a look at that right now. Well, there might be a light, slight delay on the on the camera, but you should be getting some great views of this mud nest attached to the roof of this culvert. And let me just take it out to give you the full perspective. It's about two feet in, and yes, Ryan, you yes, can Ryan. see the long, very narrow entrance hole there, where they'll probably have about four eggs somewhere in there. They can have three to six eggs on average, and often will have two clutches in a season. Yes, Ryan. Yes, Ryan. And Shouldn't have switched off the light there. Um, isn't that wonderful? Every day we drive over their nests. I mean, fascinating stuff in the middle of the road, and that's their favorite spot. I'll show you the birds quickly now, so you get an idea of what they are, or what they look like, but I'll need my mobile device for that. Red-breasted swallow, very, very, Colourful swallow, as far as they go, one of my favourites, I guess. Yeah, right, yeah. Oh, they've arrived. No ways! Perfect! Hard to see in the light. Beautiful long tail streamers, and VM's doing some miraculous work staying on them. They're such fast flying birds, and wasn't that perfect timing. Now, as it gets further away, I've got my phone out. And I can now show you some pictures. So that's uh, a drawing, and let's try and get some photos, rather. Are there going to be any photos? There we go. There you get a better indication of how fantastic these birds are. And they were just perched nearby when we drove past, and that's when I pieced the puzzle together and decided to have a look in that road culvert. And that's the little eggs that will be hiding within that mud tunnel. It almost flew in. I don't know if you see, it, it's, it's coming past again. Let's watch closely. Oh, thinking about it. Well, this is positive confirmation that I wasn't talking any rubbish. And in it goes. Cha-ching. <laughs> oh, and out it goes. Well, that was a bonus. And we don't want to cause any stress to these birds. They obviously think we're trying to eat the babies or the eggs, which we're of course not trying to do at all. Um, I prefer ostrich eggs personally. These would be a bit too small for me. So, we're going to continue on 
and we're not too far from Sydney's Wattle, so hoping we're going to find some action there. But for now, you guys are back to the action with James. I have to say, it's not often you're sitting at a lion kill that you feel a slight pang of jealousy. Scott's ability to spot nests is quite unparalleled in the annals of history, I believe. And what a wonderful thing to see a red-breasted swallow in the nest. I think that is just, that's incredible. I can't wait to see the footage of that. <laughs> there be no doubt as to the egalitarian nature of lion society you can see that they are fighting over the food there is no love lost at a kill like this there's no sharing like there would be with wild dogs it's all a fight the most dominant lioness here is the biggest one the one who can bully the others the most Tony, as you say, I mean, before that growl, it does appear to be slightly unusually um, orderly dining here. It is because there's enough space for them all, but I think things will get a little tense as the meat starts to be finished. You can see the two in your picture there. Um, are difficult to describe. So one on your right-hand side of your picture and then the one which is almost invisible, the other side of your picture. Um, those two are holding on to the same piece of meat. They are not letting go, and I think that they will have a scrap with each other fairly soon. You can see the light is now starting to fade. I'm not going to stay here after dark, everyone. We're just going to enjoy this in the day. We're not a huge fan of light shining. It needs to be done. It needs to be done. That's fine. But if we can look at an animal during the day, we will. But we still have a good 40 minutes of drive or so left. So we'll stay with them probably until then. Just incredible stuff to see. And this landscape in which those lions are lying is not a summer landscape. This is a winter moonscape at the moment, not a blade of grass on this dirt that they're lying in. They would normally be lying in a verdant green lawn. Above them the trees would be sort of shading them with deep greens. Instead we've got autumn colours all around now. What an incredible, incredible experience that was. It's very seldom that I've actually seen the actual kill, the death moment. And it is a profound experience. That those two on the left hand side there, those ones that, sorry, sent a picture for you, they're not eating the hip. Not the hip, the, the coccyx, the, um, the pelvis. So once they're down there, they must have eaten pretty much all of the good cuts of meat. And it's not easy, you know. I'm, I'm picking a carcass clean like this cannot be easy at all. from Nebraska you've sent through a wonderful quote from Gahil Gibran and unfortunately Kirsten has well overestimated my ability to remember such a quote in one go so I'm going to ask her to read it to me again it's very beautiful for life and death are one even as the river and the sea are one I think that's wonderful Thank you for that, Pat. And you can see that the, as the light fades, so these lions become, they blend more and more into their environment.
Now, Steph, you're in Boston and you want to know how long it will be before the lions move on, try and find something else to eat. I don't think they'll be here tomorrow morning unless they have uh, decided they're quite full. They might s spend the night here snoozing a bit. But the zebra's not going to last long. I, like I say, I don't think more than another... I said an hour initially, I said maybe maybe two hours. Then I think they'll probably give up. They may then just rest here for the rest of the night, if they're a bit peckish still. I mean, they could certainly eat more than just the little zebra, so they might try and move on through the night and see if they can catch something else. That's quite possible, Steph, uh, but they might not. You can see it, they're still fighting with each other. Covered in blood. Dave, should you want me to light it up a bit or is it fine? It's alright, hey? here in Michigan and you're wondering <clears throat> you're wondering about what the most difficult prey for lions to catch would be given that they've taken down this tiny little zebra which would have pr proved almost no challenge at all um, interestingly Erin adult zebra are not easy for them to take down they're very fast they're very strong they kick powerfully but I'd say out here if they weren't going for something unusual like an elephant or a rhino or a, or a hippo, for example, which would be extremely unusual. Of their sort of standard issue prey items, I think you'd find a giraffe was the most difficult for them to try and take down. And that's because giraffe are obviously much bigger. They can kick effectively with back feet and front feet. And so I would say for the lion pride like this, a giraffe or a big male buffalo would be the most difficult for them to take down. Brent leaving us. So I'm going to assume that everybody is happy to stay here and uh, if you would like to move on, um, well you can say so. I think though we'll probably stay here for the rest of the drive. I'm fascinated by this. And there goes Aubrey also. <laughs> and we'll We'll get a new angle just now. Oh, wonderful. Scott has found some elephants. Let's go and take a look. Well, what a wonderful view it is out here overlooking Sydney's waterhole on this gloomy evening with a large herd of elephants, some of which are on the northern side of the waterhole and the others are on the southern side. There's a small little kind of man-made watering point, which is just oh, over there where those ones are. So that's kind of a little fresh water outlet that they'll be enjoying. Hard to see from here, but there is a small trough there. There you can just make it out. And then the main water hole is remains of rainfall from previous seasons. But it's quite quickly decreasing, and I wonder when it will, in fact, dry up. Or let's just hope it doesn't. It's a major water source for a lot of animals, and it has been providing us with some great sightings over the last few weeks. And not only that will they be enjoying their slightly lubricated meals that they're feeding on, but they'll also be enjoying this cool weather. A huge relief after all of the hot weather we've been experiencing. Looks like a few young bulls having some argy-bargy there. Playing around with one another. A few other animals that we could expect to arrive at any stage are hyena. I've noticed that there's a couple of hyena that at just about this stage every evening, they come from some mud wallows. 
Um, guessing somewhere of Voyatella Access Road, not too far from here, and they come from a southerly direction to the north for their evening drink before heading out to look for some meals. So don't be surprised if some hyena come onto the scene. A blacksmith lapwing calling there. Chip, 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 chip. Well, there's some great news, and one of our long term viewers, Shell, in Illinois, was hoping for us to find her some elephants on a very special day called uh, your birthday. <laughs> and Earl, it's a great pleasure to wish you happy birthday and provide you with this herd of elephants. What a bonus! Hope you're having a great day, wherever you may be. I think in Illinois, you said. And this is quite a large herd. It could be two different herds that have converged simultaneously or possibly just one big one. I'm not too sure how, how many are in there. We can try and count. Oh, look at the hippo. Hello, you've come to say hello to the elephant. That's quite strange. It looks like a small hippo. And I'm, I wonder if it's not eating the elephant dung due to desperation. Could be. It's too far to see though. They technically shouldn't because they prefer feeding on grass, but during a drought, strange things may happen. Look at the elephant just kick that dust at it. Like I said, it's not a large hippo. It's certainly not fully grown. This is fascinating. And who knows why it's coming out at these elephants. We could see something quite horrible happen. You could see these elephants run into it and barge it, like I said. During droughts, strange things happen, especially these two bulls who are playing with one another. They may decide to start playing with that hippo. And I've seen footage of elephants teaching hippo, rhino, buffalo very cruel lessons and bullying them, sometimes to the point of death. And like I said, this hippo is small. Let's see what it does here. Maybe it's merely that it's very hungry, and that's no surprise. During the drought, you'll often find hippos retreating from the water early. They're nocturnal grazers in search of food to fill their hungry bellies. I'm worried that these young bulls that this hippo is heading towards are going to give it a bit of attitude. Let's see what happens. Here we go. The bulls have seen it. Let's see what happens. Obviously, we don't have the best view now because it's on the other side and we cannot move. Trust me, if we could get closer, I would love to, but this is north of our northern boundary. Here comes the hippo. There goes the bull. As soon as it turns and shows any sign of weakness, you may find the Ellie bulls turning on it more aggressively. But not so much. Not so much that I thought they would. Oh. That slightly bigger bull is now throwing its trunk out. Fascinating stuff. Nothing too serious though, thankfully, for that little hippo. But some very interesting interactions between those two large species. Um, I believe James told you he thinks it's the elephant and the giraffe that are the hardest animals for lions to take down. I think he may have forgotten about the hippo and the rhino because those two are also two very big animals um, that we get in this area. And let's just see what happens here if there's not any more interactions that may unfold. Oh no, it looks like the hippo has cleverly retreated back into the water. And it looks like the elephants are going to retreat in the opposite direction, away from the water. What a beautiful scene this is.
Now, Cheryl, we can try and count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I'll say at least 20, but possibly 25 to 30. I just did a very quick head count. And like I said earlier, it would be nice to try and get a little bit closer, but there's something I love about the view from here, and even though it's quite far away, oh, there's one way off in the distance that looks like a big bull. I mean, that is far, far away. And it still looks really impressive, the one on the opposite side of the dam wall. But this view is quite spectacular, and being forced to enjoy this vista from a distance is, like I say, a scenario that we don't often have. Hello, Papas. And you're interested to know my thoughts on man-made waterholes and how much of an effect they may have in the evolution of a species. Um, sure, well, evolution takes many, many hundreds of years, but I guess if the waterholes are here long enough, it will have, therefore, evolutionary impacts on it. But what we need to remember is that Papas, as soon as uh, us humans uh, started gaining brain power over the animals around us and the the, essentially ruining the planets to the point that we have now uh, and ruining habitats and causing animals to have these tiny little pockets to live in often fenced reserves like the Kruger National Park it's a ginormous ginormous fenced reserve um, you need to you don't need to um, but there's very good arguments for putting in man-made water holes I mean it's as natural as the ecosystem can be but it's not entirely natural because there's fences around it and animals cannot move freely as they could many many hundreds of thousands of years ago um well not even that long ago maybe a couple of thousand years ago um so uh, yes i mean there are certain arguments and people that will be completely against man-made waterholes um and other arguments for them where they can be useful like i say in areas that are fenced off like here where we are on the sabi sand so i don't think it's going to have any major negative effects i know a lot of the waterholes in the kruger national park have been closed there were many waterholes many years ago and then they realized that maybe it's not good to have too many in places where there shouldn't be water but in certain areas it's okay to have them so the, the movement is definitely towards less water holes but um, like I said there's different arguments for uh, for them and, and, and against them and because we don't know enough history of animal populations of whether uh, of animals migratory routes and movements from many years ago it's hard to be able to uh, decisively know or conclusively work out what is the right thing to do so a good question um and one that's difficult for me to answer like i like i said for for all those reasons tom and dallas you would like to know how long do I think this waterhole will last for? And I would say um, at least another month um, without any rain. So um, it's still good for, yeah, like I said, at least a month, possibly even a, a, a month and a half would be my guess without any extra rain. But I'm told that we can be expecting some decent rain, I think, later on this week. The weather gurus seem to forecast that, which is great. Okay, I'm sure you are all wondering what is going on with the lions. So, why don't you head over to James and see what exactly they're up to now. Unsurprisingly, we haven't left. Everyone else has left. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit more normally now because these microphones do struggle to pick my voice up when I'm talking whisper style. Uh, but the lines aren't affected by my voice at this stage, so I'm just going to talk to you like this. Uh, not much has happened other than they, one of them has already finished feeding. She's the one closest to us there in front. She's cleaning the blood and gore off her feet. She looks very satisfied with her afternoon's activities. And the rest of them are still eating. And they, they seem to have calmed down. There's the odd growl, there's the odd sort of uh, 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 at each other. But pretty much, I think most of the good stuff's done, you know. 
sure Scott's got something special for Walt. Well, Walt, I hope you're still with the water back. It's not going to be good enough for your profile picture, but there goes the telltale white rump of a big male water buck. It's just crossed over the road. And uh, just to know, we had, hadn't forgotten about your request, Walt, but it looks like you may have to wait for the sunrise safari or tomorrow's sunset safari to get your profile picture. We're going to send you back to James. Well, Walt, I hope you enjoyed your water buck. I've never been asked for a water buck before. I think that's wonderful. There's a lioness just getting up now. Same hung, less than hungry one walking around just to check Dave out, see what he looks like, see if she might like to eat him. But no. So you can see they're not full. Very interesting that. So, I mean, this would have been a nice meal for them, but she certainly doesn't look that full at all. She's standing only about three meters from us. That's about 12 feet. And she stands at the shoulder about four feet tall. So, I mean, she stands quite high. That's beautiful. Let me just I'll try and put a bit of light on her if you want, Dave. That's just the diffused light on the side of the car. Give you a better idea of her colour. And that's not amber eyes. Of course, she's got very beautiful eyes, that one, but they're not the amber eyes. I don't think. No, they're not. Now she will clean the blood off her face. That will stop the flies coming to sit on her. It probably tastes quite nice to her as well and it will also keep off the bacteria. Now, EV, you want to know, you obviously notice them licking the zebra there at the beginning of the kill, and you want to know why they do that. EV, you're absolutely correct. They've got sandpaper-like tongues, just like a house cat, obviously, but twice as strong and twice as hard. And they are trying to take the hair off the zebra so that they can get in amongst the skin. They reckon that were a large male lion to lick you fully over the top of the skull, it would move all the skin off your head. So, I mean, they do have tremendously powerful tongues. And she's just, she's been looking around as she came away from the kill, and I wonder if there isn't, she hasn't picked up the scent of that hyena that was here earlier. Isn't she beautiful? Very satisfying afternoon she's had. You can see the blood all over her face there. And she's beginning the laborious process of now cleaning that off. Of course, it will, apart from just attracting flies, well, not in weather like this, but in the heat, it will also attract infection. And I think that's one of the reasons that cats are such fastidious cleaners of their faces. They don't want any of that blood and gore that could attract bacterial infections on their faces and they're kind of very fastidious about cleaning it off. Wild dogs won't clean themselves, they'll clean each other. Hyenas don't seem to... Ooh, got some action there, Dave. Fighting with each other, you can just hear that blood-curdling sound. And there are some flies there, if you can believe it. Look at that. There are already flies there. Even though it's a cold day. <laughs> there, they've stopped fighting with each other now. Not so cross. Now, there are a few things I wanted to say. Just there's amber eyes. Look at her eyes. There you can see, look how, look how orange they are. Isn't that lovely? 
Sometimes I look at the others and I think, oh, is that her? And then I see those orange eyes looking at me. That's beautiful. Now, there were two things I wanted to say. The first was that obviously the chase through here was a bit hairy in terms of the amount of noise that we made. And I just wanted to reiterate to you that I'm pretty careful about which trees we run over. A lot of them just pop up behind us. And the particular area that we went through is filled with um, what we call a black monkey orange, which is an invasive species. Well, not an invasive, it's an encroacher species. So I don't believe we did any ecological damage there at all. And also, remember, it sounds a lot worse through the microphones than it does in real life. And the second thing is to say that I'm more than happy to shine a light on these lions because they are the apex predator out here, apart from us of course. I don't believe that there's sufficient hyena activity here to possibly threaten them and I don't think the light affects that situation anyway for lions. So please don't worry that we are causing them any undue sort of stress or any undue threatening them in any way with the light. It's perfectly acceptable. We do it often and they are absolutely fine with it. There are many animals we wouldn't shine the light on but lions are not one of those. So I just wanted to reiterate that for those of you who perhaps were worried about it because I know sometimes uh, it can look a little bit stark when you stick a light on these animals like this. Now, speaking of the hyenas, let's go to Scott. Hello everyone, and we've got another carnivore that we'd like to show you here. We're just getting into position. Give us a second. We're gonna get some great view of two hyena that are slowly making their way towards us. Where have you sneaky characters disappeared to? Sure they're gonna pop out here any second. I was just trying to loop ahead of them to get you some frontal views, but that appears to have possibly backfired. Come on, hyena! Oh, here we go. And they're just moving parallel to us now, not as planned, but still some great views of them. There's the one, at least in front. And Vim, I'm gonna leave that one now and go to the one behind now. Um, Probably going to pop out into that little gap. Great work on camera there, VM. They're looking quite sinister and spooky, and they look like they're heading straight to the Sydney's waterhole. Um, let's see if we can't get you any more good views. Good views. Which I think we might be able to. Yeah, this is going to be great. Oh, another one's calling. Hopefully these ones will return the call. It's just behind the bush. Here it comes. Please call for us. Please, 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 please. Other one's just in the background there, VM. Great work. I really was hoping they were gonna call for us. It's one of the most awesome calls to hear from close, but alas, no luck tonight. Maybe those ladies are gonna call for you, though, by the end of the safari. That will be great. Well, what a bonus. A carnival-filled afternoon, and we're gonna send you back to the lions now. Now, the lions have heard something off in the bush there. They're all looking. I'm going to get the spotlight out and just, just flick it through the bush there and see if there isn't something coming like a clan of hyenas. I don't think there is. Oh, I can hear some lions calling. That's what it is. Miles away, miles away. Probably in the middle of Mala Mala, long, long way to the southeast there. Here comes the second lioness now. And 
Isn't that wonderful? They're now they're three feet from us. And while we were off air, of course, I remembered that for Dave, this is a very new experience. He hasn't done wildlife before in this line. It's sad. Three feet from us. And Dave said, um, how are you so confident that we're safe over here? Now, of course, if you haven't seen lions at that difference, at that distance, it's terrifying. And the answer, of course, is that they just don't see us in the same way that they do when we're on foot, and they certainly don't see us as prey. Are they just lying down there, Dave? It's very dark, yeah. Okay. I don't want you to shine. You don't have to shine in the middle. Tom, I'm just, we're just going to quickly show you where they are. I'm not going to move at this stage because they're a bit close. I haven't got a shot. Oh, yeah, you don't have a shot. And Tom, you want to know if we're safe when they finish or when they move on? Yes, absolutely. I didn't park where that lioness came and sat, remember? She was sitting in front of us and then she moved and she felt very comfortable to come and sit there. She didn't feel threatened. She certainly doesn't see us as something to eat. Magnificent sighting. Just very, very special. Hello, Sarah. You want to know which one is Amber Eyes? Um, Sarah, the one with her back to us now and her jaws clamped shut on the right-hand side of your screen, I think, is Amber Eyes. Those are the eyes that I saw as Amber when she turned. And let's, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's who it is, Sarah, but let's have a look when she turns. If she turns. You can see that the other three, other two, sorry, have given up on this carcass now. They don't feel that there's sufficient left to warrant them even having any sort of fight over it. And what a difference an hour can make. We arrived here about an hour ago. And that was a mewling thing. A heart-wrenching sound coming out of its lungs and now it's a bit of leather and old bone really they can hear the lions they can hear the males calling miles away every time they call they look up all I can hear is ooh, 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 which you won't be able to hear Now, Darlene in New, in New Hampshire, very nice. Of course, we talked about the hyenas. They might try and scavenge this kill if a large group of them came through here. I don't think a large group will come through here. At this stage, there's not much for them to kill anyway. You want to know about the avian scavengers, the vultures. Would they come into the trees now, or are they only daytime scavengers? Darlene, two things. They're only daytime scavengers, and secondly, they will struggle to fly in weather like this. They've moved away from behind us now. Don't worry about it, Dave. Let's keep our eyes on these ones. Um, and Darlene, so on, even on a day like this, if they'd killed this, say, at 12 o'clock this afternoon, vultures would not be flying on a day like today because there aren't any thermals. They, that flapping flight that they do is very uncomfortable. It's not particularly uh, efficient for them. And so, no, only when it warms up would the vultures start to fly, then they'd spot the carcass and they'd come down here. They have to they fly with their sight. And they find their kills with sight, not with smell. The other two are just resting quietly behind us. Hmm. And all around us, a few sounds of the night are starting up. Again, it will be a quieter night because there's this kind of low-hanging cloud. So I can hear the odd spotted thick knee calling. No night jars today. Some crickets, some brave crickets that have managed to survive this dry summer. Lovely 
these sounds of the night which always creep up on you without you realizing it. Suddenly there are crickets stridulating around the place. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sound. Hello Pelican Penny, how very wonderful to hear from you, how wonderful that you are watching us. Thank you for sending through a question. And remember all of you who are watching for the first or second time, perhaps you're a bit nervous to send through a question, you think it might not be a valid question or it might be a stupid question, please don't feel like that at all. Please feel comfortable and free to send us any questions you like. Pelican Penny, you want to know if the mother of this hapless foal, who is almost finished now, would come looking for the foal or does she know it's dead? Pelican Penny, they were alarm calling around the kill during the course of its demise. So they, they would have heard it making that horrible bleating sound and they the rest of the herd was around here making that alarm call that wah, 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 wah. She will be well aware that the foal is no longer. They don't defend their foals against lions once the lions have caught the foal and that's simply because the risk is too great and so she will be aware and of course the next question pelican penny is is there a period of mourning do they mourn the loss of their youngsters um from a purely evolutionary point of view to me it makes sense that they would because if they didn't if they didn't feel an attachment to the car to the foal their motherly instinct, of course, I think would be that much weaker. So there must be a period during which there is a feeling of, uh, I don't know if it's sadness, I don't know if it is um, loss or even just confusion perhaps, we don't really know. Uh, from an emotional point of view or a human point of view, I've seen animals, I've seen impala, I've seen giraffe, I've seen buffalo that have lost youngsters to predators and I get a tremendous sense that there is a sense of mourning, there is a period during which those animals seem to feel sad. Now I know there will be a number of very kind of old school biologists that will say no, 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 animals don't feel emotions like that. Well, I don't believe that I'm afraid. I used to, I don't anymore. Keeping an eye on those ones behind us, they seem to be fast asleep. And please, Pelican Penny and any others who are sending us new questions, please tell us where you're from. It really is lovely to know where you're from, whereabouts on the great wide planet Earth you happen to be joining us on safari from. last bits of the legs going there. Let's head across to Scott now for his last segment and I'm going to stay right here. Hello everyone and we are on the search for any interesting nocturnal critters. I mentioned earlier, Brent did well to find a tiny little chameleon last night, and I fear that this drought is taking its toll on those little reptiles. We are not seeing nearly as many as you usually would in the summer, so I'm not sure if they're dying first because they can't move from, you know, a water hole as easily as an elephant can to the next. Um, so I'm guessing they rely on drinking a lot of moisture off leaves and or prey, but their prey has also been fairly scarce, not nearly as many insects as normal. Or there's a third possible uh, theory, which would be the best one for the camellias, and that is because there's so many dead leaves, abnormally so, at this time of year, it's making spotting them difficult, because essentially all you're looking for when looking for a chameleon is uh, a slight abnormality or slight change in shade from a tree that would ordinarily be all one color green but now because there's so many dead leaves different shades they could be helping the chameleons to melt in and camouflage they're usually like i say a pale shade the chameleons anyway it's been great fun having you guys out with us as always
And, oh, I think we might be in luck. Yay, we are in luck. And, Bill Burkett, you would like to know, while VM zooms into this little chameleon, this one's a medium-sized one, probably born this time last year, I'm guessing. Um, so that's great news. Maybe it's just that we haven't been looking closely enough for them. Sorry, Bill, you would like to know how far does sound travel at night? Well, on a still night like this with not much wind, very far. You could, if I probably screamed as loudly as I could, you could probably hear me from at least a kilometer away, just over half a mile. So the sound does travel, but it does depend on the conditions. Also, the fact that there's not much vegetation at the moment will have a big impact on that. The sound won't be as absorbed as much as it normally would in a typical thick summer. So winter, when it's very dry, the sound travels even further. Guys, it's been incredibly good fun driving through the rain with all of you. VM, thanks for your camera work. Thanks, Kirsty, for directing the show, and Nikki for lending a hand. And well done to James and David for getting you some great up-close action with those lions and their zebracle. We're going to send you back to them now and see you all on the Sunrise Safari. Yet again, Scott Dyson's astonishing eyes never cease to amaze me. But while he was finding the chameleons, the lions, the three of them have been eating there. You can see the hip bone of that little zebra there, and that's kind of the last of it, I think. I don't think I'm 99% sure they will not be here during the course of tomorrow morning. Where they will go, however, is not clear. They are in the centre of their territory, well, they're not, they're actually in the southern parts of their territory, encroaching on Styx Pride area now. So with any luck, they'll go north towards the Juma Dam. So watch out for them on the Pan Cam tonight and see if they don't pop around. Well, it's been an astonishing afternoon of amazing emotions for me. I know that I've seen this before, but it doesn't, it never ceases to really change for me. If to see the life of an animal snuffed out like that is, it's a profoundly, um, it's troubling to some extent, but it's also very prime evil, and I think it's valuable, to be honest. Thank you for joining us for this drive today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to Kirsty and to Nikki in the final control, and of course to Scott and VM on the other vehicle. We will see you tomorrow morning at 0530. Stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye.